Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, second episode of the Utopia of Hospitality series. My name is William Omamo, and um, I'll be your moderator today. The Utopia of Hospitality series is organized by Burma International Hospitality College, otherwise known as BH, BIHC, I beg your pardon. Many of you will know that BIHC is a world-class hospitality training institution based in Nairobi. Uh, we offer Swiss diplomas and certificates in culinary arts and hospitality uh, management. So it's a great pleasure for us to be the organizers and moderators of, of this web series. There's a lot of conversation out there about what to and not to do in this season of COVID-19, especially when it concerns the hospitality industry. But this series wants to look at it a bit differently to how others are looking at it. We want to engage the movers, the shakers, the frontliners of this industry. Those of us who work in hotels, restaurants, schools, airlines, canteens, food courts, delis, bakeries, and even candy shops. We have a say, we have an opinion. And this is that forum where you get to hear what our leaders and our opinion makers in the hospitality industry say. And also what those of us who actually roll up our hands say. Today, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, one of our frontliners, She's a great friend of BIHC. It's Miss Nana Geshaga. She's the CEO of Kenyatta International Conference Center in Nairobi. And um, we look forward to engage you, Nana. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, William. And also, of course, to the BIHC larger family. And um, it's a pleasure and uh, honor to be here. So. My first, first yeah. webinar. <laughs> super, super. Well, Nana, you know, we'd love to have you all day, but we have a, quite a short time. So I'll just get to the point of, uh, to the point of um, some of the questions that we'd like to ask you. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, tell us about KICC. Um, you know, uh, once you took the helm of it, how, how has it been for you? What have you been able to achieve? KICC has been around for close to five decades. Um, and of course, uh, the business events uh, segment has changed quite a bit. What have you done and uh, how have you contributed to the success? Um, thank you, William. And yes, you know, um, it's, it's been around for, you know, just over four decades. Um, KICC is now 47 years old. And um, I, I zoomed office um, in 2016. And of course, at that point in time, KICC has always been, it's an iconic building. I mean, I've, I've, I've not done that. But I think one thing that I have to give a tribute to is, um, is working together, teamwork. And it just shows what, what can happen when you have teamwork. So again, from um, the ministry that KICC falls under, which is the Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife. Um, well, obviously it's um, CS Balala, who is um, at the, the head and the leadership of that. Um, currently, we also have the PS um, uh, Safina, Madam Safina, and of course the board. So those are the tier levels that you have over there. And then of course, there's myself as the CEO. And also, again, we have a fantastic, fantastic um, uh, team, KICC family. Um, it's, it's, your, it, it's not your typical government type of um, um, setup uh, here at KICC. We have a very young uh, uh, task force team. The average age is approximately 30, 32 years old and um, great ideas, a lot of innovation. But again, um, there's been a lot of late nights. There's been a lot of uh, re-strategizing over the last four years. There's been a lot of repositioning um, and the, the work doesn't stop. Um, the first part was obviously to, to, to clean up KICC, um, form new strategic partnerships, um, also bring in new ideas. And I think the one that has probably had the most, you know, KCC has always had um, events here, you know, in terms of expos, uh, uh, concert, well, concerts, not really, that's what we now came in and utilized a lot of the outdoor space and did a lot of things with the artists. So um, th there you have it really. And you know, it's, um, it, it's been the face of Kenya since 1974. 
Yeah, so yeah. Um, it's it's um, it has a modern business center and a banking facility. You know, um, expansive, attractive grounds we have. Renovations of the center and rebranding is one of the things that's been ongoing, but now we're heavily are going to be moving into that, but I'm sure we'll be talking about that again. And also the center is PW, PW, PW uh, which again, it has the ramps, it has um, all the facilities for that. And I, I think the most um, iconic landmark, uh, recognizable uh, in, in Kenya. So it's, it's, a, it's an honor to, to, be, to be sitting and working here. Oh, great. Well, congratulations on the work so far. Thank now, you. Of course, you know, Nana, the, the world was turned upside down a couple of months yes, ago. Yes, of course. And, uh, uh, you know, of course, you had an annual plan worked out. You, I'm sure that you had uh, conferences and expos back to back. Uh, but now that um, uh, people have had to reposition and just change the way they do things, the global business um, events have been taking place virtually. Um, people have been meeting online. Zoom and Google Meets have basically, you know, gone viral. Everybody is uh, using it. But there's this talk that maybe it's just going to stay this way. Do you agree? Do you think that um, the virtual platform is going to take over? Um, I think inevitably it was going to. Uh, William, you know, it's it's just now how quick is it is it going to kick in? Um, I think during this pan, uh, pandemic um, has ushered in a new way of uh, organizations and uh, uh, organizing conferences, you know, and, and other events. So yes, I do I do believe that I do believe that this is um, this was always in the pipeline uh, for for meetings, uh, business events. Um, I think it's just been fast tracked now. You know, we've been forced into a situation due to this pandemic to be able to um, uh, get up, up, up onto scratch and with these platforms. So um, I think, you know, this virtual with two faced, uh, face to face uh, interactions will become the norm. And also again, you know, it's um, like you're saying, this is how we're communicating today, this morning. So I think it's giving us a time, uh, this during this time for all of us to um, uh, get used to what it is that we, we need to do um, uh, get ourselves up to speed with that. Online meetings might lack many of the benefits of an in-person conference. Um, conversations over dinner, face-to-face, -face, networking, um, you know, fresh perspectives that can come from simply just interacting on a, on a physical basis. But in virtual meetings, there's always uh, the awkwardness of less than optimal sound, um, technical glitches, we also have presenters um, doing their different parts and how everything can fit in together. Um, it's difficult to know what kind of reaction you're going to get when you can't see the people's faces. Um, but again, with, with that and stuff. But therefore, global business events will not always be virtual. Um, but I believe there will be hybrid meetings dependent on the preference uh, of the audience. But this definitely is going to take um, a center stage moving forward. Yeah, I think that that is, is a general view that many people hold that even though uh, the virtual uh, conferencing has uh, taken up some space, but it lacks the, the, you know, the personal touch that you get when you have these face-to-face uh, -face, uh, meetings, uh, the ability- Physical, exactly. Work, the, yeah. you know, that is something that is not very easy to get rid of. So, yeah. But um, what would you then say uh, COVID-19, the impact it will have on large convention centers across the world? The, what, what do you see as the, 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 the long-term Im impact of COVID-19, if any? Um, of course, there's, there's always going to be an impact with, with such a great um, uh, 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 ripple effect in, uh, due to this pandemic. You know, the operations of large convention centers have been strongly affected by the COVID-19. Um, since the onset of the pandemic, hundreds of events, you know, have been canceled or postponed. And also, I don't want to talk about, you know, maybe because as KICC, we're probably the largest players uh, because we're the largest building. But again, um, everybody in this sector has been hit. You know, the hoteliers, the hospitality industry, hence why we're, we're having this, you know, um, frank uh, conversation today. 
um, uh, everybody is, is, is feeling the, the pinch, you know? Um, in this unusual scenario, large convention centers such as KICC have to consider balancing two priorities, I have to say. Upholding the health and safety of the staff, um, sponsors and attendees. And on the other hand, it is necessary to meet financial obligations because obviously that's something that again, uh, we, we all face it. So um, we, are at, we here at KICC also in the process of strategizing and the way forward. And as you started this conversation, you know, um, everybody had a strategic plan. Everybody had, you know, their five-year plan on how it's going to go and nobody saw this or made factors in for this. So again, we're all having to go back to the drawing board and um, kind of, you know, realign ourselves. But um, that's also what we're at the process of doing. So um, we're, we're at least if, if people can already start doing that and using this time to re-strategize, um, that's probably the best thing one can take out of this uh, uh, pandemic with the impacts that we faced. Hmm. But what really drives business events um, on the African continent? Where is the appetite for Pan-African conferencing? What is it? Is it beyond the, the aspect of conferencing? Is it safaris and adventure? Is it uh, more than just uh, the conferencing? Um, I think, you know, the 21st century Africa is about opportunities, technology mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship. Um, across the continent, um, because you've also asked about the African continent, um, national and regional economies are consistently accelerating their growth and attracting the attention of foreign investors. Um, Africa has more demographic, uh, demo uh, demographic and accountable governments, you know, which is one thing that is moving forward and that we're actually seeing. Um, there's also a new generation of policymakers and business leaders. Um, they're innovative information and communication technologies, which is key. Um, in order for us to move forward. Um, and there's also an emerging spirit of entrepreneurship. One of the things as well that I think uh, that has really catapulted everybody here in, during this pandemic is you're finding a lot of new entrepreneurships. A lot of people are abandoning what they were doing before and having to survive. You know, um, you've got, as Kenya, we're very well positioned technology-wise, um, fast internet, you've got your mobile phone, you can conduct day-to-day -day business. So you're seeing a new crop of small businesses coming up. And, um, and I think that's what we need to support uh, with that and stuff. But there's also a growing middle class of, um, uh, you know, with a taste for the modern uh, and, and consumer goods. So we need to factor all of those in as well, um, because that's what also is be the driver of these business events. Okay, uh, and we see that uh, expos and exhibition conferencing is really, um, taking a huge chunk of this uh, business event segment. But KICC um, isn't, really, isn't really structured for that kind of um, um, uh, conferencing, is it? With all, you know, it's in the CBD, so it lacks um, uh, space. How are you trying to cope with that, with all of this traction around exhibition and expos uh, that are taking place? Um, I mean, we, we, I think we're pretty well strategically placed. I mean, we, we take up quite a large chunk of real, real estate in the city center. Um, uh, you know, we can hold, uh, you know, if we use our outdoor space, we can hold, you know, we, we've hosted, not we can, we have actually hosted numbers to the tune of 40,000 people. So um, uh, yeah, so it, when you look at, when you look at KCC, don't think of the physical building. <laughs> That's probably about 20% of our capacity. Uh, we have a lot of green space that uh, we're able to utilize. And also, again, for, for, um, for any Kenyan or visitor that wants to just come in and have lunch and, and sit on the ground, it's a very good green space, you know? So um, it's, it's a, a smoke screen. A lot of people just think of, you know, Savo Amphitheater, a few of the meeting rooms. But when we really need to um, get out there and, and host events, we, we can do numbers to about 40,000, you know, concerts we could clock about 20 to 30,000 um, just in one space. The beauty about the space we also have here is that we can run two events at the same time outside. We're big enough to be able to do that. So again, we can have an expo in the daytime and then in the nighttime, we can um, open up our doors to, to, to the um, concert or the evening event. So in terms of also in line, you know, with um, 
the big four agenda of wanting to have a 24-hour economy. We're on our way there. But however, having said that, you know, KSCC's location is perfect. It's in the center of everything. It's not far from the airport um, and also the prestigious hotels that are around us. Um, and as we already spoken about the grounds. But again, having said that as well, we're also constantly reinventing ourselves. We have to do that. We have to try and, and do that. And hence um, uh, my answer at the beginning, how we, how we changed the look and feel of KICC. Um, and we still have a lot to offer. So there's a lot of exciting things um, are yet to come. So Kigali Convention Center, which apparently is becoming very competitive, as well as, you know, we see a lot of hotels uh, going more into the convention uh, space, you know, uh, constructing these centers within their own facilities, trying to capture this. Um, KICC is 40, 40 odd years old. Um, how do you compete with these modern, uh, modern operations that are purely geared for this kind of, um, of, of enterprise? Um, no, it's a good, it's a good point. And also with what you say, you know, a lot of times people are throwing out, um, you know, com uh, competition, you know, Kigali, the hotels here. Um, and quite honestly, I think it's fantastic. You know, you can't, you cannot be the dominance. You're not going to have the biggest monopoly in this. So again, um, we need that competition and I don't want to call it competition. Um, I'd like to call it support. We all support each other in this sector. And if we're able to change that narrative, we are not competitors because yes, of course, it's like the hotel industry um, with the bed lights. You can't only have one hotel that's going to have um, uh, accommodation. You have thousands, you have hundreds of hotels here in Nairobi that have accommodation, but it's the different types of experiences. When I go to hotel A, this is the experience I'm going to get. When I go to hotel C, this is the experience I'm going to get. So let's look at that also with the venues. Um, yes. There's always going to be competition. And again, you know, one place that you've not even mentioned is even Sarit Center. Sarit Center have done a fantastic job in yeah. terms of reinventing themselves, getting their space together. And I think we all, instead of looking at it as competition, look at it as benchmarking. That is what we need to do. And that is what we as KICC are doing. We are 47 years old. We have stood the test of time. We are, uh, yes, an iconic building, but we also have to recognize that we are old. So we are looking. And again, that is one thing I have to really say, the support that we do receive from our, our parent ministry. You know, uh, my CS and, and the PS have sleepless nights trying to see how we can be able to, you know, revamp and, um, and, and get KICC to where it needs to go and where it needs to be. So I really appreciate that. You know, we have the oversight of the board. So of course we have our board meetings that does not get left behind. Um, the re refurbishment of KICC is always, in the forefront. Again, when I'm holding uh, departmental meetings, you know, in the strategic plan that everyone's saying that, you know, we're abandoning at this time, the only thing that we've probably not abandoned is moving KSC to the digital era and also refurbishment, which is something that now was probably phase two and three. We have now actually pushed up to be the, the front line, the, the first phase. So I welcome it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's whatever your taste is. You know, of course, like I said, we're the biggest player. So by default, if you need to have an event, which is uh, 15, 10,000 people in Kenya, that's us, you know? So again, I think we all need to, to look at the, the, whole, the whole spectrum. And I think it's also timely because, you know, as you're aware now, we have a convention bureau that is, that is, that is here in, in Kenya, that is, um, you know, something that is coming and, and moving forward. And they are tasked to push and market meetings for the whole of Kenya. And, that, and what that actually means is that that means that everybody will benefit. So well, we all hold a piece of the jigsaw puzzle that is going to actually form the new look for business events and meetings. So um, as long as we take our piece and add it, that picture will be beautiful. That picture will be spectacular, that puzzle. That, that creation will be that. So I think, um, you know, yes, there's competition and keep that fire burning. You know, your venue, Bombers uh, International Hospitality College, your competition, you, you, you have your own special niche market. Be the best that you can be in that. The hotel 
hotels out there. You know, be the best that you can be with that. And us as KICC, we are striving to be the best that we can be in that specific space. But when we all stand and line up together, we are a formidable team. And it's it's a team coming out of Kenya. So um, competition, it's support. But again, the comp competition has always got to be there as secondary. But um, let's look at it as, as, as supporting one another because the goal is to be able to have as many venues that can host meetings locally for the domestic market and the international market because that's what's going to drive the numbers. And again, that is what is going to have the ripple effect into the economy that will build Kenya as a whole. Well, Nana, you know, if we look at, if we look at um, con business events, conferencing, be, you know, if we look to the near and distant future, yes. one of the things that was there even before we had this pandemic was the issue of how hospitality is, is building capacity to respond to the, the conferencing market. Are there enough quality beds to accommodate these big events? Now, what other challenges do you foresee the hospitality industry facing? If, for one, is the issue of quality beds, what else should we be paying attention to moving ahead post this season? Um, you know, if you just look at the sector that we've fallen, which is the tourism, you know, in, in Kenya, uh, it generates about $1.6 billion every year. Uh, you know, the tourism sector, the employee employs more than 1.5 million people. The pandemic has, effect, has seriously affected the tourism industry in Kenya. Global travel has been affected. You know, there's drastic decline in air travel. You know, everyone's at a halt, at a screech, you know. Um, but again, looking on the bright side, on the 27th of April, you know, uh, 2020, the government allowed hotels to reopen, you know, between 5 a.m. and 4 p.m. just to try and, and get that, uh, that business, some of that business back. But of course, having to observe the social distancing and the hygiene practices and also the government um, uh, guidelines, strict guidelines. You know, hotels also carrying out mandatory checks for diets, uh, body temperatures you know, restricting access to those who are showing signs of fever, which is obviously the first um, uh, uh, symptom or most uh, viable or physical uh, symptom that one can see. Um, you know, also the government has also allocated some money to revive the tourism sector, you know, so everybody's really working uh, uh, to do all of that. But um, this is how it can be mitigated. This is the different things that uh, we can do, we can do to revive you know, after 18 to two months, uh, two years, when the vaccine um, has been carried out. So um, I think we just need to really, a lot of research needs to be put into, put into all of that to see, you know, how we, we can bounce back. But there are a lot of challenges. These are those I've already mentioned them, you know. Um, but again, you, you can also, um, there's solutions to those challenges that I think, you know, um, the, the, the Kenyan government with the different ministries are really working tirelessly to, to be able to enable um, this sector to still try and, and have some sort of output um, during this very difficult time. You know, So I think it's also important for us to really adhere to those um, so we know that if we adhere as, as a Kenyan, as a person um, to those guidelines, we're actually um, assisting in those um, uh, avenues to still remain open or operate, but at a small, um, small scale. Thank you. That's great. You know, um, sorry, we're going to have to let you go quite soon. I just wanted to know, you know, at uh, BIHC, we have quite a robust um, event management program uh, that we, we've introduced. And obviously, we realize, like you said earlier, that um, it's partnership, you know, as uh, we have a role to play as a training institution. Um, so do hotels and so do, you know, your conferencing and events and other stakeholders. So on our front, what would your expectance, expectation be of us as being um, a provider of um, well-trained personnel into the, into the event management industry? Um, thank you, William. And you know, like I said, um, of course, you know, um, I've, I've been to the college and the, the systems in place there are amazing. You know, you've got a very good 
educational system that sides that also um, uh, it runs parallel to the actual hotel. And one of the things that I would definitely probably just say that you know, in terms of the academic things that we need to see, is the question you even asked. You know, is virtual um, that whole meeting space going to be here to say it is? So I would definitely say, as much as you're equip equipping the new um, uh, 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 students coming through uh, your college, I would definitely say have a complete course you know that that caters to this now this is the way forward this having this arming the students even if it's a foundation course you know are you familiar with um the whole zoom how can you what i would really like to see students being able to come out of or being able to even not have to do the whole three years there but you know maybe a one semester a one term eight week course on if i was to go through it i could then leave and and be able to say i can hold a webinar arm me with that and it doesn't have to necessarily be for the hotel or hospitality industry um, or the meetings industry as a kenyan moving forward i need to know how to host a webinar now i may be doing it for if i'm a consultancy if i want to now start offering different services on an online platform you know e-commerce anything like that so i would definitely say i would love um i know you already have have some of those in place but really offer quick um you know one-on-one -on -one classes so when i leave um i have been able to invest um monetary into a course that can actually catapult me into um something with that and also go a step further you know once i've taken that course have your partnerships have your partnerships with the it industry so when i leave there everything that i've been using all the instruments i've been using i can then also get a percentage and a discount on that so it's not just theory and then i go home and i've been on a desktop i've been taught with microphones and all of that um maybe at the end of it be able to have a a, a starter package you know starter pack where i have the one camera you know the, the lighting that you can just hook onto your your your, your phone or your tripod and mm -hmm. equip me equip me as one of the future, um, uh, the future of Kenya, to be able to have those type of courses. I mean, your food and your culinary is there. Your teaching, like I said, I, I one of my most memorable days was when I uh, came to speak to the the incoming students, and um, I remember I was, you know, I, I had to cancel my afternoon my afternoon uh, uh, commitment because it was it was just amazing interacting with with um, with the students there. You know, you've got great, great innovative players. So that's something that I would I would really like to see. Equip the future, Kenya's future, with the tools and the know-how of what we're going to need. Great. Well, Nana, those are great insights. And um, like I said, you're a great friend of, uh, of our college, and we really look forward to, to, to having you over. Uh, but thank you for that great insight. We would love to have you for longer, but I know that you need to go. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Nana Geshaga, the CEO of Kenyatta International Conference Center in Nairobi. Thank you very much, Nana. We wish you and the KICC community all the best. Kwaheri. Kwaheri, and thank you so much. And as I said, we will keep you posted on our new things we're doing here at KICC. We've got a lot of new ideas coming up and again, partnerships with yourselves, because again, we are also looking to be going online and are streaming. So we're looking to also do some fantastic partnerships with yourself and everybody else and anybody else out there with that. Thank so thank you very much, William. Thank you, Nana. And stay well, safe. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We're gonna take a two minute uh, commercial break as we uh, prepare for our next guest. Uh, We'll be back shortly. Thank you. So, <clears throat> I beg your pardon. Uh, welcome back, everybody, uh, to the Utopia of Hospitality uh, web series. Um, before I introduce our next uh, panelist, I'll just like to uh, remind everyone that uh, this series is organized by BIHC, Burmese International Hospitality College. We're based in Nairobi, and we offer world-class hospitality training, offering also Swiss 
hotel certificates and diplomas to successful students. Um, the conversations that we're having here is with the movers and shakers, the gentlemen and ladies who actually work the front line of hospitality. And um, with us this afternoon as our second panelist is um, Mr. Paul Smith. He is the CEO of Java House Africa and Java House Africa's head offices are based in Nairobi. So it's a great pleasure that I have to welcome Paul uh, to the audience. And I hope that uh, we'll have him on the screen shortly. But very well, thank you. Good. How are you? Yeah, good, very good. Been interesting times. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, I've just done an intro. I, I let everybody, our audience know that you were coming on. So um, uh, welcome again, uh, Paul. Maybe I'll just give you a, a short moment just to uh, tell us how long you've been with uh, Java, House Africa, and perhaps what, what your mandate is uh, since you joined and what you've achieved. Welcome. Yep. Thank you. Um, I've been with or involved with Java now for probably just over three years. So I did the initial due diligence with the Abraj group that bought Java. Uh, and then I stayed on as CEO. Um, <clears throat> so I've been CEO for just after just over two and a half years. The mandate really was to um, bring Java into sort of world class status. I'm very happy to report that the people that I came across in Africa, having worked pretty much all over the world, were certainly leading edge in themselves. They're the best workforce and best group of people I've ever worked with or you know, anywhere in the world. So I didn't need to do anything on the world-class status of people, yeah. but it was about bringing Java from what's a typically entrepreneurial business now into a proper business that's covered by governance to making sure that things were done properly, processes, SOPs were in place. And then really looking at the core business and how we can develop and grow that. So in, in two and a half years, we have uh, increased our stores substantially. We're operating in Uganda and Rwanda. We have a fledgling business in Nigeria. We have a potential joint venture for Ethiopia. We are in the process of moving our food factory. A lot of people don't realize that Java has a three and a half thousand square meter food factory. And that's now going into state of the art. <clears throat> um, and we employ two and a half thousand people, average age 27. People say to me, you know, do you deal with millennials a lot? Yes, I do all the time. I'm also a big advocate of young people and particularly females. So we have 65% of our store managers are female. Our board is split now identically 50-50 and we're working very hard on developing and growing that. So, um, you know, my mandate is to, I, I, I sort of talk to every new person that comes into Java and they ask them the question, if you look in the mirror in the morning, when you shave or put your makeup on, the only person that will stop you getting on is that person you see. And my legacy I'd like to leave is that every person in Java will be able to get a job anywhere in the world, let alone Africa, because they will be at that level and that standard. So that's, if you like, where I am. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, well, you know, Java did come in as a, yes, like you're saying, a, a small uh, entrepreneur's idea. Um, and it has, you know, blossomed and blown up into what it is today. You see, there's a lot of American quick service restaurant culture in Java. Um, one of the things that was notable uh, even before COVID-19 was this idea about sanitizing. Um, that's very American. Oh, I, well, I, I've seen it with McDonald's and you know other these other uh, larger brands. But um, there are new protocols, there are new health and safety protocols that have been brought in and um, that, you know, uh, every Q, QSR has to respond. How has Java embarked on doing that? Um, yeah, um, well, first of all, QSR stands for quick service restaurant. So, and we are casual dining restaurant, coffee led. So, and you're right, QSRs are coming on. When a international market starts to expand, you normally get the QSR groups coming in first, the likes of McDonald's, the, likes of Starbucks, et cetera. Um, I, I'd also like to disagree with you that, that actually this sort of hygiene thing is not new. Java's been doing this for a long time. I mean, we, we have 
huge amount of food safety regulation. I challenge that our food safety regulation is, is better than most. And one of the things I'd certainly like to see the government do more about and also being more trained with people like yourselves is on food safety and, and the absolute requirements of F FSSC and HACCP and all those sorts of things. In terms of where COVID-19 has gone, I think all that's done is emphasise it a bit more. Instead of us doing it behind the scenes to make sure that you get a healthy meal, that you're in a great clean environment, we, we just brought it to the forefront so it's more visible. And you may even have seen the Java logo has got a mask on it now, and we put that out as well, which is a sort of sign of saying, here we are. So, yeah, we've had to become more visible on that. And we've had to make sure that we are, are, are making our customers feel safe and feel comfortable. J Java cares, Java, you know, we talk about Java love. We have 20,000 customers a day in normal times and we make sure that those customers and our people are very safe and very secure. So I don't think we've, we've changed our food safety or our, our hygiene. We just brought it more to the forefront and made it more visible in, in the situation we're in at the moment. Yeah, I, I, I saw those amazing basins. I mean, the, the nice hot water, I thought that that was a nice touch, but it looks like it's quite a, a heavy investment as a contraption. Is that permanent? Yeah, well, it's interesting you ask that. So, I mean, even the water that our staff wash their hands in to prepare your food's already gone through three lots of filtration systems and an osmosis system in terms of that. So, you know, we, we cover that anyway. But um, I, I think that the sinks and, and certainly the way that customers are allowed to wash their hands will become something of the future. Um, I think it's something that people will want. I, I think the way consumers will change now will be uh, a lot more conscious of the social interaction that goes on. And, and thereby lies our challenge, you know, hospitality and restaurants are social places. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go to China where you have a one child policy, they get out and they socialize. Africa is very social, everywhere is, and restaurants and pubs seem to be that. Yeah. So yeah. our job now is to make feel, people feel safe and comfortable in those environments and those visible aspects of that, which includes something like a visible sink for washing your hands on, I think it's going to be something of the future, yes. But you'll find that in many of the local places where people eat nyama choma, you'll find these basins are there already. But um, the ones that Java look very sophisticated and are they Kenyan? That's the first question I'd like. To yeah, ask. yeah. And look, we, we uh, as a business try and procure and work with as many local organisations as we possibly can. And one of the things that I changed coming in two and a half years ago, you mentioned it, that Java is very loosely based on an American type diner to begin with. And we've stopped all of our importation from there. We have some importation from China and some from Europe, but we will only import what we can't get the standard of locally. And again, one of the things I think that the challenge that the government has and we have is that global supply chains will be inhibited for at least another 18 months to two years, in my view. And I think it might change the whole emphasis of that. I'd like to see more opportunity for local businesses. So I'll give you a great example, packaging. We, we get our packaging from China, some locally. But at the moment, local businesses aren't able to do that. I'd like to see now the support coming in from governments to get these local businesses working. I'd like to see support from, if I take one of my favorite subjects of potatoes where we process eight tons a day, we have a specific potato in, in, in Kenya, but I'd like to see different varieties being grown. I'd like to see support on the farmers to increase the the actual opportunity of them growing varieties that we need and other people need. And let's get more of it driven into local businesses because that's the way we support Kenya. That's the way we support jobs. And that's the way we support young people coming through. Yeah. So why, why is it that Java cannot have peptine as a ketchup? Uh, you know, some local chili sauce. Why must it be Tabasco and Heinz? Well, the other thing about running a great business is, is, is that you have to listen very carefully to your customers. Um, and what you hear and what actually the reality is often different. So let's take those two examples that give me. We, we do a lot of what we call co-creation. So we create menus with our customers. If we're going to launch a new brand, we use a group of customers to actually help us co-create that, to give us views on things, to give us perspectives on things 
to give us a view on a new product. Is it too salty? Is it too spicy? How do you dial that up? How do you dial that down? Uh, and on the case of those two things, we've trialed them and we work them and our customers simply don't like them compared oh, really? to what else we want. So I'm not talking about what I feel. I'm not talking about what my procurement guys feel. I'm talking about what my customers say. Now, we work very, very well with a, a, a local supplier, Bio, that does a lot of milk and we, we needed a different type of milk. When you're producing milk for a coffee, it has to have the right fat content and protein content so that it froths perfectly to make that perfect cappuccino or latte. You know, I'd like to work more with local suppliers to start working on what, what they could change to get the sort of products that we want. But at the end of the day, it's the customers that make the decision about what goes into Java, it's not us. It's really important that, that they have that input really. And that's the reason why we don't do it. Wow. Well, you know, I mean, Java has a very di diverse uh, uh, market, uh, de demographic, so to speak. All sorts of people uh, walk into Java. And uh, well, in my personal opinion is that um, customers who appreciate um, brands will be there, but there are some customers who will look at a, a product and say, oh, great, suddenly Java has local uh, ketchup that, you know, peptine is a good brand, it tastes good. And eventually you train the appetite, you train the palate of people. Yeah. To and, you know, you're absolutely right. If you, if you argue that, that I think Java has probably been responsible in the 20 years that it's been there of putting coffee onto the sort of palates and markets of most people in Kenya and certainly in, uh, in Nairobi. And those things change. Uh, and, you know, more, the more that we can develop local side, we will do. And it's not that we're dismissing it at all. We work constantly with suppliers on innovation that they're doing, innovation that we're doing. We're looking at launching something new in, in um, the Java portfolio. We've done the Kikito brand and we'll do that. So if we, if we, you know, customers start demanding things, it's not that we just ignore them. We listen to what they say and we can trial anything mm -hmm. uh, at any time. But, you know, each of these things has to be brought on and, and, and where there is demand, we will demand it. So the message who's listening to, to this, if, if you want that ketchup in our stores, then let us know, we'll give it a go. You know, this, we're not ruling it out. You mentioned 20,000 uh, customers uh, um, per day, yeah, um, which is phenomenal. Um, obviously, it's going to take some time to rebuild that momentum. What are some of the things that you're looking at? Um, you know, some people say that, you know, is Java's menu, is it really a healthy menu? Uh, I know that, you know, there's a lot of emphasis and, you know, if you look at the, the the menu engineering, there's a lot of, uh, and you know, you say healthy this, healthy that. Um, but what would you be looking to do to, you know, rejuvenate the, the volume uh, of, 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 of foot traffic into the stores? Yeah, I'll talk about the, let me just talk about a little bit about the impact of COVID and, and things I think businesses are not doing that they should be doing at the moment. Um, and then I'll come on to answer that. One of the issues that you, you're dealing with with something like COVID is that there's an awful lot of planning gone into how you respond to this epidemic. But one of the key things of the future that's going to come more and more and more, which I, I think, again, with your students, is something to work on. I was listening to the previous speaker about preparing your students for the future is about what I call consequential thinking. OK, Java will not look the same in the future. They will still have the stores, but those stores are likely to be smaller. They're likely to be in a place where we can handle this sort of uniqueness of environment differently. There's likely to be more space required now for takeaway than there ever was before and deliveries, because I think this will change the way customers handle their meal structures and, and what they're doing. Uh, and one of the things that we're looking at now is that we already had it as a strategy, but we've dialed it up now and we're doing a lot of work in the lockdown period on this. We'll move more into catering. We'll move more into buffet type operations. We'll move more in where we can stop the over-reliance on stores, certainly for the first 18 months to two years, which is in my view what this is going to take, the length of time it'll take us to get out on that side. 
So that's the big strategic stuff. When you come down into the detail stuff, that means the menus will, will change slightly as well. We'll get more specific takeaway menus. We actually run a lot of healthy products in our menus, but we're going to be dialing up vegetation, vegetarian menus more than we've ever done before. Mm -hmm. Also, I think the other thing that people have to think about is the, the we deal in perishable supply chain. So I think the supply chains are going to struggle for the next six months. Most vegetable and salad growers work on 13 to 14 week cycles. They've stopped planting because there's no demand at the moment, which is going to lead to a shortage at some stage. Animals, they can't afford to feed a lot of these animals at the moment so, and there's no demand for them. So they're having to deal with that. That's going to put a shortage in. So I think we're going to have to get cleverer at being more local and better at using the ingredients that come through and the seasons that come through. And that will undoubtedly mean a change in the way we handle our menus, our structures, our training of our people and our store designs for the future. So there's a lot of thinking currently going on at the moment in all aspects of that, really. But it's down to that one thing I said, consequential thinking. If this mm -hmm. happens, what's the consequence? And in my view, the world is not clever at doing that at the moment. We'll need to get a lot better. Now, that's an interesting perspective. I've certainly taken that in. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Um, so what makes Kenya such a unique uh, market space compared to the other regions so far as um, the casual dining scene? That, that's um, an absolute easy one to answer. It's, it's the people. I mean, I've lived and worked in China, I've lived and worked in Russia, I've lived and worked in the Middle East, and, 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 and. The, the people in Kenya are by far the best I've ever worked with. Dynamic, interested, want to learn, and have that real skill on the side that everybody sees as a negative, which is to be able to hustle. Let me tell you, in Java, we've got the hustling skill, and we've put it into that entrepreneurial thing, and just let people go. People talk about empowerment. I don't think there's such a thing as empowerment, okay? I don't empower you to do something. You empower yourself. My job is to create the right environment for you to flourish and grow and develop and come out of who you are. And, you know, if I asked all your listeners now and I asked you, if you knew without a doubt you were intelligent, what would you do differently in your life? And how would you change your business? And how would you change your studying? And how would you change what you do? And when you ask that question, the answers are amazing. It just starts to let people go. So I think by far it's the customers, it's the people there. I don't run a business, I run people. And I think business leaders in the future are gonna to have to become more and more people leaders in order to make businesses work. And, get, and that's a whole different way of thinking than perhaps we've done before. And again, I'd like, I, we're certainly pushing that as a big agenda in Java. We've had it for a long time but it's becoming more and more of that now in terms of what we do. So, so how do you instill that people culture in the staff? Yeah, well, again, it, it's, it's uh, as I say, we start on that first day of recruitment that the only person that's gonna stop you getting on is yourself. Um, we create an environment, we celebrate things that go wrong as well as things that go right. That's how you learn. Um, I have a team of people working with me underneath that. We use what's called a G10 team. That they are the future leaders coming through. And they can get on and do the areas and take the decisions that they need to, um, for, you know, in terms of what they want to do. So instead of me sitting and saying, right, as a CEO, what I need you to do now is look at the catering side of the business. How can we leverage what we need to do? What resources do we need to do? And give me a business plan. I just say, stop measuring the inputs, which is what a lot of people do. This is what I need and measure the output. I need in three months, a fully fledged catering operation proposal put together and business planned, off you go. You know, and, and stop worrying about that level, let people go, let, just let them do what they need to do. And you know, occasionally nudge the tiller if you like, if you're on a boat analogy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the same, it's the same with customers. I think customers are starting to become more fickle on what they want, they're becoming more demanding on what they want. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a, it's not a hassle to us this this is a good thing because it helps us change the future and more vocal the more vocal people are and the more you listen to them really listen to them i think the more successful you'll be in the future okay so 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 as a market leader and as as a, a benchmarker uh for you know for others to 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 to, to copy or 
um, to look towards. W what pressure does that put on Java and how does Java respond to that? Well, we, we have three big pillars in Java, the first being great food and beverage, the second being great African hospitality, and the third being absolute integrity in all that we do. And I think all that does is, is to dial those three things up. We, we need to make sure that we act with absolute integrity with all of our people, our suppliers, our, our, our partners, our banks, our customers, our staff. I mean, we are in a situation here where I have two and a half thousand employees and not one of them has lost their job <clears throat> during COVID-19. Wow. Now, we've got a situation where people are going on to some furlough side, but my aim is that they don't lose their jobs because these are highly skilled people and we need to work hard to make sure that we keep as many as we can do. And we've done that with integrity, transparency and honesty with all of them and telling them straight away what's going on. We've done that with all of our partners uh, and everyone. So we'll keep that integrity. In terms of great food and, and great beverage, it, it's maintained all the time, but really listening to customers and making sure that that's done right. And African hospitality is like nothing you can get anywhere in the world. It's something very special. We just need to make sure that African hospitality comes now with the comfort of knowing you're safe and you're secure and that your food's being prepared well, well in a safe environment, which it always was but that you now know really clearly that that's what we're doing for you. So to me, it's the same three pillars, but just really emphasize more and more. And look, we, we, we talk to a lot of our um, competitors and, and other people who talk to us about what we're doing. In this time, we're in here to help everyone. You know, the, the, the business is wider than any one individual really. And, you know, we've listened to what they're doing. They've listened to what we're doing and, and we're all trying to support that network to make sure that we have businesses here that are sustained and good and solid in the future. And are your investors at this time confident with the continent and uh, the, the potential for expansion? Yeah, I mean, a lot of investors, we, we were taken over by Actis um, when, when the Abraj group got into trouble. Um, our investors have been massively supportive to us. We now run we normally run board meetings once a quarter. We moved immediately on the COVID-19 situation to once a week where we do a board update. So our board is fully up to speed, everything that's going on. And, you know, the secret of dealing with things like this, I had to deal with something similar when their second war broke out in Kuwait when I was based over there. Complete shutdown. The secret is good comms, honest integrity with your comms and your people. And that's what we've done with our board and, and our board and our investors remain very positive about Africa as an investment. Uh, obviously, things now have to be dialed down and repositioned. And I think coming out of this for the next year will be more about making sure our core remains solid. And we probably have to delay some of our expansion plans. But that's fair enough. We're in a place that's 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 has to have that to be done. But our investors are very positive about Africa and remain so and uh, very positive about what we're doing as well. And I have no issue with that, as are the banks as a matter of interest. So. Mm -hmm. Well, it's all about partnerships and uh, um, you have really given some insight as to what uh, training institutions like ours should be doing. Um, we haven't had much interaction as uh, BIHC with uh, Java. Does Java have its own internal mechanisms or does it occasionally reach out to um, organizations such as BIT? Yeah, uh, look, we, we, um, one of the things that we've been criticized for in the past as a whole in the business is that we've kept ourselves to ourselves. And um, you don't know, for example, that we process a ton and a half of chicken a day. You don't know that we process eight tons of potatoes a day. You probably didn't know we had a three and a half thousand square meter food factory. <clears throat> you know, you, and, and those sorts of things, you, you probably didn't know that we do an awful lot with farmers. We do an awful lot with, uh, with uh, charities. We've not been very good at putting that picture over and, and that's our fault. We do work with lots of groups. Um, we employ people from many, many areas, including your own. But yeah, it's it's things to to get involved in more, and I think we're going to have to do that. We we I think one of the issues because of that is in certain markets that you can work in, and I've worked in them, where you have staff turnover of 
55, 60%, which is the average turnover of staff for an F&B industry in the world. Therefore, you have to seek good employers and you, you liaise with that. One of the things that we've never been faced with is people applying to us. So therefore, we, you know, we've, we've not had to do that. But that, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do. And I think one of the things, again, that will change as a result of COVID-19 is that we need to make sure that the people that we get coming in now are trained for the workplace of the future. So, you know, one of the challenges to you would be that, you know, that this process of learning is not a process of techniques, which is what most colleges do. This is a process of actually being one with the world and our business now. And, you know, I think back to when I did my first training and my first degree, it was called an industrial based degree in six months of it actually had some good, solid working to understand how the theory gets into the sort of practical side of it. And, you know, and theoretical is no substitute for practical learning. I think that's going to have to come back more now so people can understand what's changed mm -hmm. and where we can help you shape that and think about that, be delighted to do. But I think that's the single biggest thing that needs to now be rethought. If I challenge you now, you know, you've, you've dealt with your COVID-19 as you've done, but what plans have you got in place now to make yourself future-proof for what's going to happen in the market of the future? It'd be interesting to hear that from you at some stage. So that's where I think we can work more. Okay, super. That's great. Well, 30 minutes goes in such a, it goes like a blink of an eye. Yeah. Um, Paul, thank you so much uh, for yeah. taking the time to, have uh, spoken with us, a uh, great insight. And um, we look forward to engage you uh, more when, when we actually have the restrictions lifted. And uh, if you agree, we would love to have you again on this platform uh, to further indulge you in uh, your great wisdom and your great experience. Um, and let us wish Java all the best uh, moving ahead. No, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to coming on here. Very, very much enjoyed it and, and um, look forward to working more with you guys. And to everyone out there, Kate, stay safe. And remember, the only person stopping you getting on is who you see in the mirror in the morning. No one else is stopping you. That's a, that's a big one. That's the nugget for the day. Thanks yeah. very much. All thank the you. best. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. That was um, Paul Smith. We have come to the end of this um, episode of the Utopia of Hospitality. We look forward to invite you again next Wednesday to um, the next episode. In that, uh, as I think it's now in the public domain that Monday is officially a public holiday, we have pushed the, one, the episode that we typically would have had on a Monday to Wednesday. So we will be in touch with all of you through the media platforms. Thank you very much for taking time to be with us uh, this afternoon. Have a good weekend. Kwaheri Asante.